United States has the highest incarceration rate in the world, hardly the bastion of freedom as claimed by some. Within the states, Louisiana bureaucrats cage the highest proportion of their fellow person, and among cities in Louisiana, New Orleanians are caged at the highest rate. In the past two decades, those incarcerated in Louisiana have doubled. That's attributable not to a surge in violent predators, but the structure of the criminals and justice system. It comes down to incentives. As happens elsewhere, in Louisiana, money is attached to each inmate, which motivates prison operators to run their facilities at full or nearly full capacity. As one pundit wrote, each inmate is worth twenty-four thirty-nine a day in state money, and sheriffs trade them like horses, unloading a few extra on colleagues who have openings. Exemplary of the failed model is Orleans Parish Prison, or OPP, headed by Marlon Gussman, who seems to have no qualms with the frequent escapes, physical and sexual aggression, and poor conditions of the facility, which John Smith, a Department of Justice employee, called alarming. Though OPP has an infirmary to treat people on site, the violence inside the walls is so prevalent and severe that in just one month in 2012, almost two dozen were sent to ERs and outside hospitals, and in the past seven years, almost four dozen caged at OPP have died inside the facility. So bad is the situation on the ground that the U.S. Marshals no longer house inmates at the facility due to concerns about conditions and safety. To be clear, Gusman, like so many others similarly situated in their own little fiefdoms, seems more concerned with controlling the perception about himself and OPP than in making systematic changes to mitigate the current harms and bring about a better situation. For example, after a video surfaced that showed gambling, drug use, and possession of a firearm inside OPP by those caged, Gusman wrote it off. Without contraband, without uh, knowing whether or not they were drugs, actually, and I might add, as I said today in court, uh, the video quality it looks like it's been uh, greatly uh, changed up. I don't know. I don't know what to say about that. Gusman's response to the frequent escapes from OPP, half a dozen in early 2012 alone, was that escapes happen in every facility in this country. Three inmates escaped from the temporary housing center around 9 o'clock last night. The Sheriff's Department says that the surge has intensified. In November of 2011, individuals employed at the Department of Justice sent a draft consent decree to Gusman to rectify conditions that were said to violate the constitutional rights of inmates. It took four months to receive back a substantive response from Gusman. In April of 2012, the Southern Poverty Law Center, an outfit that these days seems largely preoccupied with adding to the misinformation, fear, and division peddled by big government apologists, through their then point person on the ground, Katie Schwartzman, filed suit against Gusman on behalf of 10 current or former OPP inmates. Later that year, in September of 2012, in a letter signed by John Smith, who called the OPP a violent and dangerous institution, the Department of Justice joined the suit against Gusman and OPP. In December of 2012, Gusman signed the consent decree, and in June of 2013, it was approved by U.S. District Judge Lance Afric, who called OPP an incredible stain on the community. Per that consent decree, Afric is now overseeing OPP through the transition stage. So is that it? Are conditions at OPP going to improve? Perhaps, though that'll be tough based on the institutional culture of OPP and the actions of Gusman. For example, just weeks before the House of Detention was shut down and those housed in the building were moved to a temporary tent housing, Gusman paid his friend's company hundreds of thousands of dollars for renovations. Why? Well, because it wasn't his money. It had been taken from taxpayers. The temporary jail itself came in over cost and behind schedule. The contractor for that gig was DRC Inc., an outfit started by former FBI employee Robert Eiskin, who's been involved in shady business practices in the past. And recently, a couple in Gusman's inner circle, John Sins, the purchasing director at the sheriff's office, and Gerald Hoffman, the director of maintenance, were charged in federal court with taking kickbacks and rigging bids for contractors. Nepotism seems the norm for Gusman. In one instance, Gusman and his friend, Paul Sins, the brother of John, his former colleague, who worked as the chief judge of the municipal court, hired each other's wives despite a state ethics law that prohibits participation by a public servant in a transaction involving the government entity in which any member of his immediate family has a substantial economic interest. Gusman hired and paid $90,000 to Ann Sins to oversee OPP property sales 
while Sins hired and paid $30,000 to Renee Gussman to counsel marijuana offenders in his court. Judge Sins admits he waived a formal selection process for Mrs. Gussman's company. Even maintaining accurate accounting information has proven difficult for Gussman. For example, in 2011, he failed to provide the city of New Orleans with a functional budget, and the amount spent to settle OPP-related lawsuits, initially quoted at $195,000, later ballooned up to $3.8 million. U.S. Attorney Harry Rosenberg has said that Gusman's accounting practices are reminiscent of the Wizard of Oz. Far from having a neutral party audit the books, Gusman hired Albert Richard, who for many years worked as Gusman's campaign manager, which caused Ed Quattrovo, the Inspector General for New Orleans, to call for Richard to be investigated for misrepresentation due to the indisputable conflict of interest. Afric and others involved hope that things can be improved going forward. Part of that includes a new FEMA-funded facility for OPP. Phase 1 is a $70 million kitchen and warehouse facility. Phase 2 is a $145 million facility built to house 1,438 beds. Phase 3 is a $55 million facility that's slated to hold 600 special population beds, which hasn't yet been funded as Gusman has never submitted plans for the building. And while FEMA, which is really taxpayers from afar, is on the hook for most of the costs for the new OPP, Gusman has asked the New Orleans City Council for $11 million more in funding for staff and equipment mandated by the decree. Mitch Landrieu, the mayor of New Orleans, responded, I cannot in good conscience cut vital services or raise taxes to put even more money into an office where waste, fraud, and abuse runs rampant. So some uncertainty still exists, but there is hope. Consider Brian Collins, who wanted to help those in his community. Collins left the business world and took a job at OPP. Collins found the conditions there so dysfunctional that he made public his concerns. By doing so, he's given a voice to those so often voiceless. Shortly again after starting there, uh, the horrendous conditions, not just the physical building, but the general, um, uh, how would you say, inhumane treatment of the inmates uh, began to affect me. Clearly, driven by his interest to engage in damage control, Gusman hinted at pursuing charges against Collins, though more recently he has said Collins can return to work. Whether he'll do so or not is uncertain, as concerns of his safety under Gusman's watch are definitely valid. Other legalese things worth noting, a few years ago, marijuana possession was decriminalized in New Orleans. Also, last year, parole requirements and sentences for minor crimes were reduced. And now those active with the Reason Foundation and Pelican Institute are pushing for the abolition of mandatory minimum sentences. Others are calling for the new OPP facility to have a cap on the number of beds, something they believe will help to curb the perverse incentives of housing more and more people in the chase for greater funding. What is clear is that people should not be kidnapped and caged for actions that cause no victim. We stopped by OPP, but weren't presented with much in the way of transparency. This is an area that jails more people per capita than anywhere else in the world. Do you think that's a good direction to go in? Do you think maybe there should be less of a focus on victimless crimes when people don't hurt others but they're thrown in jail? You have to contact the lawyer, the sheriff, consult him at 827-8000. Okay. Be able to answer all your questions. Well, I hope you at least think about it, you know, because everybody plays a part in like the bigger system and it's important that we all like understand how much it it like does real harm to people when they're thrown in jail without having hurt people and especially in a place where they're doing it more than any other place they spend the least amount then we we are simply the last stop in the criminal justice system right i understand that but uh, i mean might it be uh you know help move help to change some things were some people internal to speak out against the current policies if they thought them not ideal uh, why they're incarcerated here that is determined by other aspects of the criminal justice system we are charged with housing them providing for their care custody and control uh, I, I applaud you for uh, being interested in the system and thinking that we could do things in a different way and I would encourage you to pursue that line of inquiry, but until we get something specific from you that that is related to the uh, Orleans Parish Sheriff's Office, 
I'm not sure I can help. Yeah, I understand. I guess like going back to my initial questions about, you know, maybe some folks in trouble speaking out if they if they think some changes are necessary. It kind of, you know, parallels with uh, Mr. Collins, Brian Collins, who, who spoke out. I mean, maybe that will incentivize other people to sort of speak out or at least, uh, you know, work towards implementing some changes. I'm trying to help you, uh, but I see no way that in my official capacity that I can. Okay, yeah, I mean, maybe that's it. Maybe uh, if we step outside of the uh, what we're officially tasked with and, like, uh, look to our own conscience. I mean, I don't know. You probably have thought about what I don't know what you're talking about, sir. If you've got a specific question for me uh, uh, and and you're with a legitimate news gathering organization, we can talk. But other than that, I'm going to have to uh, get off the phone and I I bid you a good day. All right. Take care. (laughs)